March the 28th, 2018. It's our final live show as we get ready to hit the sea for the next seven months. Reality is setting in. <laughs> it's been a frantic pace. Just all uphill, all week, all weekend. I feel like I've been in a hundred fights this week. Fist fights, and I've lost every one of them. <laughs> you gotta get up and dust yourself off, and get back into the fray, though. Because extinction events don't really give a shit about the norms. Hi, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for getting us this far. We're just up against this hideous cult known as nuclear, spickable scum involved in it. The media, your universities your, are your worst nightmare. The most disgusting things I've ever... You can't make it up how... how vicious your media and your universities, your professors, the students, nuclear academics, nuclear students. How do you get that evil? How do you get that despicable? How, how is it that the world sat here in silence when they told you that a nuclear meltdown or nuclear waste or nuclear releases is like a banana and walking in sunshine, getting on an airplane? This is your media and your universities pumping that into everybody's head for 74 years to the point where you can't have a conversation and where they believe the lies themselves now because they've told a lie for so long. Not only that, if you look at the picture below on your screen, your media to your right is out telling everybody they're inside the building to the left to, to fake that. It's not just faking the effects of radiation, they're faking the actual reactors. Uh, I'm giving six gig orders why they're giving bonuses. I'm giving six major restrictions and censored worldwide but they're put on a pedestal to lie. How, how do people like this even sleep at night? How can our universities and institutions even exist? How come we don't have a functional police force to deal with this 74 years of robbing everybody of a future? So I don't get it. So they can have a job? See, that doesn't even make sense. Um, it's not like a banana or a potato chip. It kills the animals. Every animal. No animal survived. If an animal was cured by radiation, they would have it on a platter every day. Whoa! It cured the animal, Dana! They can't do that. After millions and millions and millions of deaths, they still haven't cured anything. And you take your loved ones to the hospital and you put the same isotopes in them, expecting a different outcome, is the definition of madness, of insanity. So for the record, I'm not a bad person for going out and doing species counts, the last species counts ever done here in British Columbia. It was seven or four years ago by me. There's been no species counts in seven years on the coastline of Canada or United States that we're aware of that are public. And then it's so easy to do a species count because you can't really expect to find more than 10 or 15 species no matter where you go. Hi to everybody. And as we do our last stream, we're looking for any questions and answers. Hi, everyone. And I thank everybody for their patience. 
this last number of years, it has to be trying. I ask people to support me. I show the documentation of why they should support me. I show the lawyers, I show the information. I live need Kathy. And Shani again is in your blue, is Elaine. And hugs for Elaine. She's going to be bored out of her mind now for seven months. <laughs> Hi, Mindy. And Liz. Hi, everybody. Robert. And if you. Hi, everybody. So. Tonight is, I'm going to start off with some clips here the last couple of days as we slowly, yeah, I'm, I won't be leaving until I'm ready for sure. I'm not, we haven't stopped. I'll explain some of this coming up. Hi, Joe, which is 239 Joint, Joe Moore. Hi, Joe. And Amy, Night. Hi, everybody, that I don't get to. Hi, everybody that is watching this later or tomorrow or tonight. Strontium is blogging, folks. Check out his site. He's been blogging for a long time on Fukushima. I'm not, I'm not going to be here to blog anymore, so if you can find a few people out there that are trying to talk about the subject, um, it's so difficult. Organic slant is still out there kicking and screaming. It says two people won't be stopping anytime soon, I don't imagine. They seem, they're like me, where they're, they're here for the fight. I, Alex, and we don't expect too many people. Hi, Ganda. Hi, everybody. So what can I bring to the table for everybody tonight? Vancouver, Canada, a test showed iodine-131. Now, of course, it doesn't travel by itself. The iodine-131 was the tracer, and it's at 100 times above what's considered a drinking water limit, which is an emergency limit. There is no safe limit. And the reason being was because there's forecasts from different institutions showing the radioactive plume coming in to the coast. And everything that hits the Rocky Mountains on the west side washes down to the coastline eventually. We got a little VIP. We got the drone working. That was a nightmare, trust me. And But we got it, the basics. And this clip is just 4K, but on your end, you're getting 720 or something. Uh, but we, we got it working, and so we can look forward to some incredible footage to help tell that story. And you can see I got the submergible there on the ground and the big camera. This was Saturday. We had sunshine, went down to a park on the outside of town here. So I'm right on the Pacific Ocean here in Powell River, British Columbia, Canada. And just get some of the kinks out of it. It's a very difficult uh, operation, <laughs> for sure. But now we, now we know we got the basics, right? So that's huge. Submergible is working. The big camera is working. Uh, Just gonna grab the, the big spinnakers and see if we can get a sock put on them. Which is the sales shop here. We'll go get a quote anyway. It's Monday, just a few days away, hoping to leave. And I got the back of my right leg muscle is bruised really bad, but we'll see how it goes over the next couple of days, I guess. <coughs> and so I woke up on. Uh, I had to take a nap on. Sunday or Saturday, and I, t I had a bad dream where I had a serious pain in my calf muscle, my Achilles. So I woke up, 
and say, thank goodness that nightmare is over, but it wasn't. And so that bruise, I ended up with a deep bruise. The muscles, because the muscles in my legs are, are shot um, from my accident and not being able to do anything for so many, for over a decade, I lost all the muscle mass in my legs. And so all the work I'm doing caused a uh, Charlie horse, I suppose, one way to put it. But I've been crippled ever since. A bit better today. And today is Wednesday. So it's been chaos. Yeah. You spent 65, I'm oh, sorry, $86 on this. We're going to go up and drop off the sails. You got a big one in the back and two right here. Get socks for these two. That didn't Let's work, by the way. Fix some of the work on the other one. That didn't work. It's Monday. It's chaos. And so the GPS, I've spent almost every day, several hours a day, trying to get that to work. It turns out it had to do with the memory card and... To rectify, it's going to take like two weeks. And so I ordered in another card. That's going to be $200 tomorrow. And then today I also bought, um, I didn't get the uh, charger that we wanted, but I got a, another one half price because we didn't raise any money since last week. And since... Um, Thursday or something, we haven't raised anything. And I'm just so busy, I can't get out and stream and tell everybody what is jeopardizing the operation for sure. And so I've, I've cut down on my hopes and wishes, and I'm just going to go for the beer essentials because we're going. The only way we're going to get... See, the hardest part about a seven-month expedition is leaving. <laughs> Once you leave, everything else will fall into place, right? But just that little bit of rope was $86. And that's for my jib. It's so frayed, I had no choice but to replace it. And it's heartbreaking, $86 for 60 feet of rope, which is short for what I needed. So $85, is it? 86 So we just paid $400 to get the motor. We're waiting for him to bring the motor out. We're going to mount it. And so, yeah, $400. $400 for the motor. So there's no motor there right now. You can see the 9.9 .9 is missing. And then in this clip, wah, I got the 9.9 .9 back. So this is huge. That's huge. And so we got a new carburetor on the 8 horsepower that runs like a charm. We got the 9.9 .9 .9 back in order. That runs like a charm. The 115 works like a charm, and the 2.5 horsepower Honda, we got up there, so four, all of these are four strokes, uh, has only been started once, it works like a charm. These are four strokes like a car engine, so the point of this is you're not supposed to have to struggle, it just fires up on the first or second pull, it's easy start. And so this, this is very huge inf information or um, news. So we're good to go. We'll be towing that behind the, the sailboat. We have four little headlines here we'll talk about. Japan considering moving capital away from Tokyo. This is why you don't want to have the Olympics in Japan. Forecast showed Tokyo on a radiation threat. Forecast. Uh, yellowish residue found in Tokyo area, radioactive pollen. Highly likely that uh, pollen had reached the capital. No, the capital is nothing but radioactive pollen. Fukushima fuel rods were melting, by the way, 75 minutes after the tsunami. So the reactor cores were not covered with water 10 minutes after power blackout. That's insanity. Um, Japan's Prime Minister studies setting up alternative capital away from Tokyo for, for them, not, not for the people of Tokyo. 
they weren't going to move them. They were going to move the government 200 miles south, the opposite way of Fukushima, right? And so the Hook 7 turned out to be a big mistake for me, $850 mistake that I can't turn the clock back. And so tomorrow I'm going to burn another 200 or so on the map, and hopefully that solves that issue. If that doesn't solve the issue, I've got to pull everything back off the boat because it's all installed. And this is Sunday down installing it with a blown calf muscle. And it turned out to be a nightmare. You can see I had to get the old, because you got to put a new sounder on too, so I had to take the old sounder off. I broke that. That can't be put back on. It was a nightmare. That's the way it's supposed to be, I think. And as if the ocean is going to be any less when I finally get out there. <laughs> <laughs> so the last four years I never even got a single break and I got no break in the next seven months coming up not even a single day off and then straight out into hell is the way it's going to play out I can't afford to stay at the wharf here. And I can't, I can't, we can't afford for me to stay here. We got to get out and find out what's going on. We got to go out and survey the coastline. It's going to take many months. And so I had to take all the wires out and trade everything up. Now I got to go pull it all again and put it in the box and bring it back and try to get my money back, get another something else. Obviously, going to have to be cheaper because we can't. I can't take a chance and wait for something to show up when we want to be out of here in three days. So tomorrow, if we, that map doesn't work, pull everything. It's just, it is what it is. And I didn't use electric tape to seal the hole in the floor. I thank goodness I probably wouldn't be able to get refunded. I was really looking forward to a big screen GPS that would get me into all the anchorages and avoid everything, right? And it's just like total chaos. So we drilled it. We got that mounted, but it's, we'll see tomorrow anyway. Now, this is my last live stream. I'm probably going to post a short video before I leave, but it won't be in this format. It'll be just a normal camera. Pushing a forecast. Uninterrupted line, uninterrupted, uninterrupted. So, so a continuous line all the way across. In other words, a continuous cloud, an invisible cloud, covered the entire Pacific and North America. And people says, oh, well, Dana, you know, they didn't want to panic the population. They being the goblins that lied to us for 74 years. They didn't want their families to know they were monsters. And so a typical serial killer that's married, they, they kill their own family rather than uh, have their family find out they're monsters. That's what we're looking at here with the nuclear industry. They'll kill the planet rather than ha and their family rather than admit to their families that they're monsters. And they are monsters. If you're in the nuclear industry, you got the attributes of uh, every mass murderer throughout history in one. So look at these people pretending they're in a building that don't exist. Does that not concern you? Does that not worry you? That they're lying about that. And so... Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jace. Now, for anybody that's not familiar, a quick brief rundown is we're going to take the sailboat. Well, we got the beak one up. 
Let me get off course This is a few here. days back, or last week. Don't pay attention. We got the big one up. So we're going to take the sailboat and tow that up the coastline again. And so we got two zodiacs, and they pack up in the one zodiac, and we can carry everything. Boat zodiacs. Now the big zodiac, the sailboat gets tied onto a tree when I finally get up there in six weeks up by Alaska and start working my way back down the open ocean and the coastline and the interior. And the idea is to do species counts, insect counts, bird counts, mammal counts, go into the communities and harass whoever needs to be harassed and try to interview whoever is willing to be interviewed. And... No more weather like that and blown pontoons, because that was an emergency. Now we're going to just take our time and meander through the whole coastline, because that's the only option we really got. And we're going to do the species counts again. And so this is a big coastline. This is going to take up to seven months or longer. And we're probably not going to get a second kick at the can, so we got to get it right the first time. It's uh, too much work for one person, but that's the, the cards were dealt. There's no big organizations throwing tens of thousands of dollars at me so we can hire a bunch of experts, what so-called experts, or even... See, it's so hard to get anybody to go out for seven days, let alone seven weeks or seven months. And then you got to get them in the port. It's logistically a nightmare. And you can't do it on no budget, which is what we got. And so we built the fleet piece by piece by piece by piece till we got to this point. And now we're trying to raise enough money to get out there and go to war. And so it's a very ambitious from the get-go. But we've already done the whole coastline like I showed you earlier. We know what the species are supposed to look like. And this is the same spot, before and after, the same spot. Pre and post Fukushima. And it's stunning, yeah? It's stunning how everything is, all the color is gone. It's completely stripped. And so what they decided to do was hide it from everybody. And, but because I'm, I have thousands of hours underwater as a commercial diver, I loved the ocean. I loved the coastline. I was infatuated with it beyond anything imaginable. And I understood how privileged I was to be in the environment. Trust me. I work hard for everything we've done. And I follow through on all of my promises. If, if it could be done, I get it done. And some of the things I'm sure everybody thought couldn't be done, yeah, it's done. And so that brings us up to now. Now we're going to be leaving on the expeditions. Um, now, we just had another 49 dolphins wash up dead on the beaches. 49 dolphins in Argentina, Brazil, where we also seen a few months ago in the same area, 100 and, um, what was it, 115 whales or something washed up on, down on the bottom end of it. Several months ago, we covered that. Um, Australia, and we'll cover that coming up in a little tiny bit, had 150 whales wash up a few days before that. Washed up dead. They starved to dead. Same as everything else we're seeing. Scientists have been left baffled. Baffled. They've never had, by the way, um, this happened down there before. 61 short-beaked dolphins were found washed to shore. Washed to shore. Think of those words. They've been watching my stuff, obviously. On a beach resort in Argentina. It is the first case of marine mammals being stranded in that region. Therefore, it's an unprecedented situation. And so everybody 
and the media is out there. Oh, the other one's washed up because there was a sick one and they were trying to help it. So they're smart enough to do that, but they're not smart enough to get off the beach. Gotcha. Yeah, you people are disgusting critters, trust me. So Australia just had 150 whales wash up. Dead. Now, the Secretary of the Protected Areas, Nestor Garcia, suggested a large influx of killer whales around the coast might have driven the dolphins to shore. Well, that's not about happened. They washed, they were already dead when they washed up. So I got a couple of clips coming up for everybody. The world's killer whales are in trouble, especially around the coast of Britain. Scientists have found that one of the UK's last resident killer whales, who was found dead on the shores of Scotland last year, had record amounts of a banned toxic chemical in her body. Scientists say the levels of the man-made chemicals, known as PCBs, were among the highest ever recorded. Our science correspondent, Rebecca Morell, has more. So, you see him talking about everything but Fukushima. It's not easy to find orcas off Vancouver Island these days. Now, this is Vancouver Island last year. These are some of just 83 of the magnificent marine mammals left in these waters. So there's only 83 left? They're all related, part of female-led clans, as scientists call them, and their numbers have been shrinking. Now, as scientists call them. Now, they bring up a guy who was a tour guide, not a scientist. The southern resident killer whales that we've just seen specialized in eating fish, uh, primarily salmon, and primarily not just any type of salmon, but Chinook salmon. So now he's there saying he only eats Chinook salmon. Don't forget those words. They're really important for what's coming up. By the way, if you go look up what a killer whale eats, it feeds on seabirds and squid and octopuses and sea turtles and sharks and rays and fish. And they also eat most marine mammals, such as seals, etc., etc., sea otters, baleen whales, sea lions, squid, blah, 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 blah. They estimate 140. There's a lot more than that. Now, here's a story. See, this is important because what they're, by saying what they're saying about the orcas and, and the Chinook salmon, they're saying the Chinook, in, in another word, they're saying the Chinook salmon are gone, right? And, but they're blaming that at the same time on the dying whales. They're going to say the whales are dying because they can't get their food Chinook salmon. This is a ludicrous story. And they don't bring a science, they bring in eco-tours. And I looked him up, he's registered in Victoria, British Columbia, not on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And Victoria, British Columbia, Canada is the capital of Canada. It's all government entities. You can't even rent a place there unless you're a government. It's 100% government. Now, the year before, was a half a million birds. Believe one of the orcas that called... Now, this one also is about orcas, rather. Washington Waters home has died, and now her calf is in danger. I am alarmed. I've seen the necropsy reports from day 32. Ken Balcom has studied these whales, including their ability to reproduce for decades. He's with the Center for Whale Research. This is far more sinister, where we're losing reproductive females and their babies. Uh, you know, when you when you don't reproduce anymore, you don't have a population. The no. news, while not confirmed by a carcass, might as well be. This is the last picture of J-28 taken by Balcom on October 2nd, along with her youngest calf, J-54, a male. He says the whales are emaciated, underweight, underfed. Emaciated. Emaciated. Underweight and underfed. Emaciated. These are not words that you can associate with a whale. Ever in the history of any civilization. But listen to the rest of it. And the short supply of the whale's natural prey, Chinook salmon, forced the mothers to draw from fat, often filled, often filled with, filled with accumulated toxins from their own bodies. Which is what they said about the UK. So they're saying the whale can't get salmon. 
the Chinook salmon. By the way, the whales eat dolphins and porpoises and large whales and penguins and sea lions and seals and squid and uh, whatever they want. There's no limit on them. They're the apex predator. So for them guys, once again, not, not Ken Velko, but for the media to throw in the Chinook salmon meant they knew back then the Chinook salmon were gone and they were trying to, um, right, because the killer whales are such an iconic animal, no matter where you're to on the planet, they were looking for a way to marry that up with the killer whales to explain away the death of the killer whales without admitting that the killer whales were in trouble. That's why they're proposing to raise and release millions of small salmon over the next decade to feed and encourage the orcas and eventually to have more fish that they can catch themselves. To feed the whales. But what's going on there is they're obviously going to get a lot of money to raise salmon is what's going on because they're part of the cover-up. See? But the salmon don't survive when they release the small fries into the ocean, they die right away. Two adult female killer whales and two calves tearing into a still wiggling shark. 2016, uh, killer whales are considered apex predators able to hunt without fear of being hunted themselves. So they hunt everything. They don't just eat salmon. And so the media is complicit as usual into the cover-up, yeah? Now, at the same time, we see mass die-offs of the whales, the birds, and including all the, the northern polar bear are emaciated. That was last year on Isle of I've got to find that clip and start using it, but we're heading to the ocean for seven months. 2016. It's one of the biggest mysteries Alaska has seen in some time. What caused hundreds of thousands of seabirds to wash up on our shores? And the sick and starving seabirds were murs plucked from beaches where most birds had already died. So they had some live ones were brought and many in. Of the birds, when we perform the necropsies, they actually have empty stomachs, so we're not finding any food. Empty stomachs? Half a million birds. They know the birds are starving. The bigger question is why? Probably. So they know the birds are starving. Are starving. Think of it those words indicative of something going on. Now, the common murk can dive 600 feet. They get krill or shrimp or anchovies or herring or whatever. That's not, not, help, not well. Fisheries and oceans. When the ocean isn't healthy, it's usually not just one species that's impacted. Yeah, but just from anecdotally, I know that a lot of fishermen are, are worried. What does this mean for what's going on in the ocean? It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> A question scientists hope they can answer sooner rather than later. Every time they interview fisheries, they come across, like, not, this is not the normal fishery officers in your community. This is uh, the bureaucracy fisheries. Those people are so disconnected from reality. They, they actually think of themselves as better than everybody, and they think of themselves as public relation, and they perform those those jobs, and they always do the same thing where they don't show any reality. They're just there for the corporation, the Lauren corporate Maxwell, personhood. KTVA 11 News. Now, scientists say as many as half a million MERS died. The most recent in mid... Half a million starved to death. Mid-February, up to 8,000 showed up on the shores of Lake Iliamna. So the ones... This is a freshwater lake, saltwater birds that can dive 600 feet in salt water, uh, 8,000 of them died in one section, just one nook, a small corner, washed up in one corner of a lake far away from the ocean. That's why that made the news. So they couldn't find food. Now, the reason the birds died wasn't because of smoking. Yeah, quite a few of them are smokers, but they didn't. you didn't get a half a million birds die from smoking. They died... Because when the birds were flying along the coastline, we noticed because we went out, they looked down, there was nothing there. See? Instead of being like over there where they could have landed anywhere on the coastline normally, fly along the coastline, they would look down and see all the food. Yeah? 
to your left, you would see all the food. Instead, they seen to the right. And it was naked. There was nothing there for them to eat. See? I went out there and surveyed the whole coastline. And so now we're forced to go back out and do the species counts. And I'm forced to keep doing what I'm doing right now in order to try to raise the money to do this. And I think it's perfectly acceptable for everybody watching this to say, Dana's friggin' nuts. Dana's crazy to think that he's going to do anything or change anything by what he's doing. And so, like, I get that, right? And I accept that people see me that way. But ultimately, you'll see things my way where somebody had to be honest. You had to have somebody that was genuine and sincere and would go out and find out for sure. 100, as you could trust, you can say, no, no. He took pictures and documented underwater and video, and there's no samples to be taken. And who are you going to bring it to? The people who gave me gag orders? There's no one out there to trust anymore. We covered everybody out there. They're all willing to stab you to death every second of every day. On a drop of a hat, they will swarm you and stab you to death to make themselves look human. See, the coastline is stripped. And if that doesn't drive you to do the things like I do, I can't help that. In the future, or the near future, you'll appreciate why I, and what I've done and why I've done it. And you may look at this whole operation and say, so, oh, Dana done pretty good. Look at that. Do you got any, first off, do you got any idea what a nightmare it is to maintain that? to try to even fund that to park it, to try to even keep it operational. Do you got any idea how many fuses we're talking about, how many batteries and wires we're talking about, how many things that go wrong and does go wrong we're talking about? See, it's a labor of love. Nobody would take this on, so it had to, but it had to be done. And it had to be done right and sustainable. It's a living nightmare every second of every day from here on out, too. All I can do is one little screw up, I lose everything. I lose everything. One little screw up, one big storm catches me off guard. I make one simple mistake, I lose everything, including me and all the documentation. When I come ashore, I have to spend months uploading it to my website that has to be maintained, by the way. Like the amount of work goes into everything I do is, is a five-man job every day, but Dana has to do it because Dana's by himself. And the world is not supporting Dana at this stage, only a handful of incredible souls, incredible, amazing people on this planet have put me in this position because I asked to be put in the position to take on the industry because nobody has ever challenged the industry. But an extinction event is not something you just sneeze off. It's not something you just switch off when you go out like I did and, and you experience it. Like you say, $400 just to get the motor up and running again. I was lucky that that's all they charged me. But I don't have the $400, but I found it. I don't have the $200 for the charger today, but I found it. I don't have the money for the $200 plotter maps tomorrow, but I'll find it. I don't have the money to go up the coast, but I'm going because we got no choice. It's got to get done. Everything has to be done. I have to go away and leave everything now for seven months. And so packing for seven months is a nightmare. It's leaving your home for seven months is a nightmare. Going out there by yourself for seven months, even though that looks good, you know, that, that looks pretty good, but it's. It, it goes so, so quick and so readily and so easily. Instead of sticking cameras underwater, we got an underwater drone. Not that sticking cameras underwater is a bad idea, but instead of being out there in the rain, this is a rare picture. And this is a very valuable picture. This is such a rare picture. We washed up on the rocks that night. We had a blown pontoon that day, and that night I 
got caught in a hurricane and washed up on the rocks. And we done several thousand dollars of damage. I think we dumped a little motor and we flipped over the Zodiac. We busted up all the props. We went to hell and back. Okay. And so now we're going to go back out. Thousands of penguin chicks died because too much ice. In other words, they starved to death. There's no such thing as too much ice. This is what penguins do for a living. They live in amongst the ice. Marine mammal experts claim an unusual. And by the way, an iceberg doesn't sit directly on the ocean floor. Penguins go underneath it. Marine mammal experts claim an unusual high number, number of whales and dolphins stranding off Cape Cod. Federal government issues a disaster declaration for the pink salmon fishery, but the true amount of dying marine and bird life in the area recently is astonishing. Yeah, everything was dying during this period. And nobody explained it away. They just buried it. This recent story of 150 whales found beached. They weren't beached. Like when you look at the pictures, they washed up. That's not beaching, that's washed up. We covered this a few days ago. And these are heartbreaking stories. Be and they say beaching usually occurs on the coast strip during migration. No, it doesn't. So the media loves to play it down. It's a despicable, there's no such thing as media. It's all been bought by public relation firms. Alarming biodiversity declines threaten food and water. Food and water. Yeah, the bacteria is disappearing from our forest. You know, when I done the whole coastline, I was looking for spider webs in the forest. And you got better chances of getting hit by a Soviet satellite in three, two, one. But normally you go into a forest, you're slaughtered by spider webs, not anymore. No, no insects making noises. Now, this story here, scientists witnessed first known case of orca infant side. This is on Drudge Report. This was uh, the day before he had the 150 whale story right by that. He pulled that story and left the other story up. So he pulled the story of 150 whales washing up like logs. That was my version. And instead left this one up. Scientists witness. Now that was just 50 miles or so from where I'm to. And I'll, ha I'll be having to go right past this place. And so I'll be going in there with the camera and trying to do an interview with these people. This is an alert bay. Like first, I'm going to have to run over to Camel River or somewhere like that and get more stuff that we don't even got the money for because as soon as I get 30 miles up the coast, there's nowhere else, only Prince Rupert, for me to buy or get repairs and these little communities, a couple of little communities along the way, but there's no, there's no big big spots. So where I'm going, it, there's nothing. And so I've been trying to do everything I can the cheap way, and that's going to get me fucking killed ultimately. Freak weather, orange snowstorm. Now this story, when you think about it, regardless of what caused it, a snowstorm, orange snowstorm, submerges tourist resort with uh, orange snow. Scientists have blamed the airy snow tint, which varied from light yellow to intense orange and even brown, on a mix of sand and pollen. Uh, a spokesman for the center said the cause of the phenomenon was likely wind carrying sand from the Sahara, which then fell as rain. Wind carrying sand from the Sahara that fell as rain. So sand molecules, great big mass of sand, is picked up by wind. It's not sent up by a nuclear explosion or a forest fire. These particles we're talking about, nuclear, is, is a million times smaller than the sand. 
So the sand can make it, but not nuclear fallout from Fukushima. Right. Now, nuclear fallout from Fukushima was recorded by major institutions. Here's one of the models from the Norwegian Institute for Air Research on Xenon 133, which is just a tracer. You're looking at North America, the entire continent covered. Here's a map from NOAA, the American government, and the dispersals from a single reactor in Japan, because despite what Christopher Busby says, the jet streams are actually real. So you can't trust Christopher Busby, Helen Callicott, or Arnie Gunnarsson. They haven't come out and denounced the reactor four fake pulls a single time. They actually supported the story. They came out and pretended that they were getting the fuels at a reactor four. So, see, we're not the generation of idiots anymore, right? We're, we're an informed population where we can go out and look up stuff ourselves and find out the jet streams were actually real. And they weren't counting that we would look that up and figure it out. Australian forecast, Austrian forecast shows maps east of Los Angeles from the Fukushima fire. Here's a evidence of sharp features. This is a plume hitting Canada, sharp features. Several studies in the radioactive releases from the Fukushima nuclear power plant exist. See, here's another one. High levels as in Japan on the west coast in California. Yeah? And they say it's not toxic, but uh, it travels with everything else. And of course, it's toxic when you breathe it in. It's from a chain reaction from a nuclear meltdown. A nuclear meltdown means all the atoms and the particles, which are different uh, emitters, are hot particles, or hot atoms, or hot isotopes. Or cesium-137 forecast showed high altitude radiation cloud concentrating over California, because that's what pollution does, by the way. cesium-137 forecast, April 13th, over North America and the planet. So they decided to hide uh, just a handful of organizations. And your universities, like, uh, in reality, they should be just thrown in a, in a meat grinder. And I know that sounds cruel, but look what they've done to our planet. They destroyed everybody's future and everybody's hopes and dreams, including their own children, so they can pretend that they're special for another day. Season 137 plume forecast, North American Europe. France is IRSN. Not enough for you. See, there was so many, there's so much documentation of the plume based upon lies and deception. So when you add in the real numbers, Swiss models, you had so many models of the radioactive fallout. And everybody's like, no, no, I can't reach North America. Elaine sent me a, a radio interview of a popular guy on the internet. He was saying, there's no way it can make it over here. Absolutely impossible. Yet all the pollution from the industry makes it over there. All the forest fire makes it over there. The sand from the Sahara Desert makes it everywhere. But radiation can't make it over. But radiation is much more mobile than sand. See, you have all these models based upon just two or three weeks and the dispersal over the entire Pacific. Look at the entire Pacific is covered. So it falls all the way to the ocean floor. It goes all the way up in the upper lower strat uh, stratosphere. Now, we can say this is too big. We can't do nothing about it. This is literally, you know, If you're sitting on, in the middle of the road, there's a car coming, are you going to get up and get out of the way? If your kids are out playing on the road and you hear uh, the local neighbors drag racing down the road, and do you go out and yell at your kids to get off the road? If you're coming home and your friends, you're at the club and you're both drunk and your friend walks out in the road and there's a bunch of traffic coming and you're, you're not... A, and you, you're not so inebriated, probably not a good example. But do you leave your friend in the middle of the road and say, ha, ah, you stupid, you're going to get killed? No. 
like do you, like if you got a big bonfire do you go stand up in the middle of the bonfire see so like when you see danger you recognize danger but you can't see this is what i'm saying to you but that doesn't mean it's not dangerous and that means you that does, doesn't mean you can't recognize it and that doesn't mean you can't do something about it and that doesn't mean you shouldn't do something about it and that doesn't mean that you wouldn't do nothing about it and that doesn't mean that we 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 can't do nothing about it we can we can filter water we can pass out seeds into all the communities and have them grow organic food throughout the communities not just for people but also for the biodiversity for the flora the flora put the nutrients back into the environment see there's so many things we can do we can come up with technology to filter water why why do we just got to lie down and, and let them kill us why do we got to lie down and just give up because a handful of chicken necks are able to influence people from our universities and our media like are you, obviously your universities shouldn't exist anymore there's not a single academic out there in any other discipline who spoke out either. They all remain silent so they can pretend that they're special. So the biggest betrayal to us is the academics. 100%. The worst people on the planet history will show are journalists and academics. Journalists who sold you the lie. 74 years, journalists every day now, they don't mention the words bananas and walk in the sunshine very often anymore. I can assure you, we pretty well browbeat the shit out of them for that one. By the way, I'm Dana Durham for the nuclear proctologist.org. And we have been at this for a very long time. All we're trying to do is have a conversation. All we're trying to do is fight for the future, is to, is to have a future. And to end this misery machine, this idiotic, nightmarish, despicable, disgusting, hideous, lying pack of shit known as nuclear. Nuclear is the most pathetic, disgusting, despicable creature we've ever, ever encountered in the history of humanity. We've never seen anything as hideous as nuclear. Now, I'm taken off. And just, I've got a couple of headlines here we're going to shoot to. This is last week's headlines. Japan requests Hong Kong to lift ban on food from Fukushima and its vicinity. Now, see, that's such a disgusting... The next couple of headlines I'm going to show you tells the story. Oh, this is the way Dana Smurfs up. Is it? I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Hang on. <laughs> I'll get it. There we go. <laughs> Japan requests Hong Kong. Japanese foreign minister met with the Hong Kong chief executive on Sunday and requested the territory lift a ban on imports from agricultural products from the Japanese prefectures. Uh, near the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Yeah, but nobody lives there. Why Why not grow the food somewhere else? Why grow it by the nuclear power plant? Can't anybody ask that question? How hard is it to ask that question? Uh, and then the next headline on the same day, Hong Kong will not lift post-Fukushima ban on some Japanese food, but others they did and will. Hong Kong will not lift the post-Fukushima ban. Well, why do you got a ban on it for? Because it's bad, it's dangerous, it's deadly. See, 2018, this is a 2014, where Abe is eating flatfish. Look at him, claiming it's from the Fukushima to promote it in 2014. And the agenda was there in 2011. They had farmers going back in right after the accident and growing food and putting it on the market right away. They never wasted a second. This is the nuclear industry. Now, this is important what I'm going to tell you next. Was this was planned all along. When they had the meltdown, the next meltdown, they were going to grow food and ship it worldwide and start the extermination. This is an extermination event. 
this is a genocide. This is now, once the accident happened, they, they switched gears. And there's a lot of um, misdirection that came out right away. But they were growing food right away and selling it right away on purpose, knowing the effects of it. And then the media, of course, Fukushima is saddened. Well, there's only 4% of the people who returned. And the others are revolted by what they're doing. And of course, you never put a name to it. Writer, Kyoto News. See that up there? Fukushima saddened. Saddened. But the people are not saddened that they're poisoning everybody. They're saddened because no one wants to eat the poison food. This is your media. How can you, how can you sit there without throwing up? By the way, the Japanese government hopes to enhance economic ties with the territory by paving the way for Hong Kong to lift the import ban. What are you talking about? Enhance economic ties by poisoning everybody. Tokyo also hopes Hong Kong's action will lead China to relax similar restrictions. Well, poison one country so China should let you poison them too. As Beijing has banned food imports from 10 Japanese prefectures. 10 prefectures, not just Fukushima prefecture, but 10 prefectures. See, in the near future, everybody will go to war against Japan. Everybody in every community on this planet will ban everything from Japan soon. For sure. Without question. The whole world will turn against the entire industry, and anybody that was actively at this will be hunted down and dealt with but her own family members will crucify these people in the near future. Hong Kong banned imports of fruit and vegetables from Fukushima Prefecture and four surrounding prefectures, citing a nuclear disaster at the plant triggered by an earthquake and tsunami 2011. This is the first time in 21 years that a Japanese foreign minister, by the way, has visited Hong Kong, and they want Hong Kong to let Japanese after 21 years of not going to Hong Kong, they go to Hong Kong. You're going to let us poison everybody with the Fukushima food. Oh, is that the food where everybody moved away? Yeah. What are you, you, we're Japanese. You're going to let us poison everybody. That's the agenda. So why are they growing food and shipping it worldwide and for, trying to force countries to consume it? How do we get to that spot? How do we get to the spot where the media says that Oh, Fukushima said that you won't eat your food. How does that become a media? Shouldn't they have their throats ripped out? Like people like that, where I come from, we kick the shit out of them every day for the next seven weeks. And hopefully, they, and when they're unconscious, we leave them at the low fucking tide line. So they, the autopsy says they fucking drowned it, okay? A murderer is a murderer, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it for anybody, period. I don't give a fuck. How many gag orders you give me? Kono and Lam also affirmed cooperation preventing North Korea from evading sanctions. Like, so on one hand, they want to poison everybody. On the other hand, they're cooperating with the propaganda machine about North Korea. The Americans went in, the military industrial complex, I should say, and they name palm, napalmed, burnt, in the worst way possible is what that means, if you're not familiar with what napalm is. In the most hideous fashion, napalm is fire that sticks to you. You burnt down every village in the country, flatten it. There's no reason for, for a country to hate you after that, I'm sure. Hong Kong will not lift post Fukushima ban on some Japanese food. Think about the words. How disgusting to use the word some. Chief Executive also reaffirmed that the city has been strictly enforcing sanctions against North Korea. Once again, we see these connotations of North Korea in the same conversation. Hong Kong banned the imports. They're going to hate what I'm going to show you coming up next. They imported fresh product and milk from the prefecture and the four neighboring prefectures. So... She emphasizes in covering upon the government to safeguard public health and hence effective measures must be in place to ensure food safety and maintain the public confidence. So the first Japanese minister, foreign minister, visited Hong Kong 
since the colony transferred to Chinese rule in 1997. So, earlier on Sunday, they had visited the Irian department store in Taiku, where he tasted food from Azu in Fukushima, including rice, sake, and ramen. They're exempt from the ban because they're not fresh products. So I take the fresh product and turn it into a, a preservative product. Now it's, now it's okay. So you can say it on paper, but if you say it to my face, I knock you out right on the spot. That'll never change. I don't care how many times you arrest me, that's not going to change. You're monsters. He said it's scientifically proven. It's very safe. And those people from Hong Kong who come to Japan are already eating spinach and cucumbers from Fukushima. So they're shipping everything. They're growing food in a place where nobody lives. The government is doing this. And then shipping it out and then using it and saying, well, they're already eating it here. They're already eating it there. So when the accident happened, they raised the limits worldwide. And then Japan had a lower limit. And said, see, our limits are lower than the world's. So we're more strict than the rest of the world. That was the game, yeah? And so the same Fukushima governor, Maso Urchibori, touts exports at Paris event, at a Paris event. So he's gone to Paris, to France, at a promotional event in Paris suburb. Paris suburb. I said they don't put no names on these stories for the authors, for the journalists. No such thing as a journalist anyway. A journalist is somebody you should fear and loathe and hate and despise. Well, that'll become natural soon, won't it? Said he hoped to see an increase in Europe-bound exports from the prefecture, which is recovering from the unprecedented, unprecedented, think of the word, Triple core meltdown seven years ago, which is recovering. <laughs> Hang on. I got to admit, I just miss doing these live shows. Less, I'm worn out each day, mind you. See those turps? They're... They're one ton bags underneath that are radiation. They're picking up the radiation and growing food there to trick people into going into the communities so that they come out and say, well, why won't you eat the food from the radiated? They won't say the word radiated place, but why won't you eat the food? We picked up bags. You didn't pick up nothing. You got homeless and destitute to do it. You tricked them and deceived and manipulated them. Now you're murdering the children that are left behind so you can pretend that you're half human. So this Fukushima governor is truly a despicable monster. The Japanese, the nuclear industry in Canada and America is completely out of control. They're, they're gone crazy. They're gone rogue on the planet, yeah? 100% rogue against our planet. While noting the prefecture still rebuilding, Uchi Bori praised the European Union's easing last year of import restrictions on food from Fukushima and other prefectures. There's 14 prefectures there that are so radiated that they're shipping the homeless in to pick up bags to pretend that it's, they, they solved the problem. You can't solve the problem by picking up bags because the trees themselves are radiated. The pollen is radiated, the water, the grass. Everything is radiated and everything is died there. Insects and eggs and bacteria and everything is gone. Those who attended the event at the French shopping mall. So instead of having going through normal sh academic channels, they go to a shopping mall and they have dried or they have peach juices made in Fukushima. With children there, they're giving children peach juice from Fukushima. And the illnesses don't show up for several years. So we're, we're talking about completely out of control. 
the whole, and it's just the nuclear industry. There's not that many of them. At some point in the near future, the planet is allowed to go out and kill them all on the same day. One of the visitors said products that have been past France's import criteria can be trusted. See, there's no safe levels of radiation. Just because some idiot, some bureaucrat monster said, here's a limit and it's under the limit, do you feel that you should trust these despicable monsters? There's people out there that actually feel that it's safe to trust these people because they had a limit. Somehow a limit now was okay. Noting that the prefecture now can export processed fruit. Processed, because it's not fresh. The radiation doesn't deteriorate whether it's fresh or processed or canned or uncanned. Emphasized that Fukushima traditional craftsmanship has not been affected by the nuclear disaster. And so, when you look at those stories, Fukushima is saddened by Bangkok. They say, we're confident about the safety of our fish. You're confident about the safety of your fish. There's just a handful of you doing it. You're being paid by the government. The Japanese government has set a limit for radioactive cesium in sea product, 100 becquels a kilogram, which it says... which it says is stricter than the international standard. 10, 11 becquels children start to see uh, heart problems. 50 becquels a kilogram, even adults will see permanent lesions in their organs. This is just a, a couple of exposures. If you're going to eat it all day, if it's going to be in your... Like there's no logical reason to be doing this only suicidal against the planet nuclear is a suicide bomb against the planet it's on a scale so small you can put two million atoms on the head of a needle you can't see them but that's two million cancers distributed out over 10 or 20 years you'll see two million cancers if you give everybody an atom that sequesters in your muscles your organs or your bones he said, I'm very sad that the scare about the fish continues, even though its safety is confirmed, said a worker who gets minimum wage. Who cut fish so experts can measure cesium levels. It's cesium is a tracer. Just because you don't can't find you like you don't look for cesium, you dry the fish out, you ground it up. And you might even incinerate it to liberate the isotopes so you can, you can find them. So these people are either stupid and complacent or they're monsters. We can't just give up. We will tenaciously keep telling people the safety and the tastiness of the local fish and official of the prefectural governments. The prefecture is now considered inviting Thai journalists to Fukushima so they can learn about the local fishing and radiation tests at first hand. Thailand has been the largest overseas purchaser of Fukushima fruit, including peaches. And while there has been no negative responses to the event promoting fruit from Fukushima, officials are concerned that the cancellation of fish serving event could have a negative impact on fruit exports to the kingdom. They're worried that they won't be allowed to murder everybody in increments over time. Remember, France, Fukushima rice to be exported to France. This was a few days back, right last week. Fukushima rice to be exported to France. The governor of the nuclear disaster, Fukushima prefecture, appears likely. So almost all these headlines were in the last seven days. So there's a massive push to export food from a place where nobody should even be. You don't want food because all the children get sick later. You, like the fact they're putting these fake Geiger counters there to trick the children so that the Olympics can pretend that they're safe is this should horrify everybody on the planet that we're looking at that picture. 
That's the most scariest picture conceivable, along with all the other pictures similar to it. Yeah? All of these pictures are truly frightening because they're sacrificing these victims to pretend that nuclear is somehow safe. Like, how can you, how can you not fight this with everything you've got? How can you pretend that it looks like that when you know it's destroyed? How does that work? How do you wake up some morning and say, I know I'm going to be pro-nuclear and fuck the whole planet? How does that work? How do you get that evil? So a trading house to export rice, not a government, not an institution to certify it, not someone to put their name on it, but a trading house to make a few dollars. How did we get this stupid? Local product including rice, beef, and processed fruit because it's not fresh. He seeks to dispel concerns about the safety of the food. This is over and over and over and over and over. We see the exact same uh, reason. Well, we're shipping the food and we're putting Kim's kids in harm's way to dispel the the. They call it rumors that they picked up 30 million one-ton bags. They call it rumors. They call it the fear-mongering that we say the buildings are destroyed. They say the buildings are not destroyed. And they use that, of course, to attack people like me. Yeah. It's unsettling that we live on this planet and that we don't have any big organizations reaching out to me. Just a handful of incredible souls supporting me. Supporting this, not necessarily me, it's the work. I shouldn't say me because I don't really exist. My work exists. I'm, I'm just, I'm some, I'm, I'm the key or something like that to the engine or whatever the case may be. I, I play, I play a part, but see, it's not me, it's us. How can it be me when nothing exists without all of us? Well, just because I say me, don't mean it's me. So how do you justify all these bags, grown food and sake and everything else in the most radiated place? How can you grow rice? How does that work? How do you grow rice there? Uh, like, got 120,000 sites like that. 30 million one ton bags, probably 100 million for sure, more like it. You have to run away and leave your sh communities and your graveyards, your homes behind. 30 million one ton bags is proof you can't eat food there. Like, you can't go to the communities, but you're shipping the food from around the communities, from the radiated fields, right alongside the bags. They're growing rice right alongside the bags. And you call it a rumor. And dispel concerns about the safety of the food. Like, the fact that they're not concerned, the fact that the media is not able to show a picture and say they got every right to be concerned. Rice from Fukushima will be exported to France for the most radiated place on the planet that will stay radiated till the end of time right now. And there's nobody in France fighting for France to survive. Sources say the government is also likely to cement a plan to increase, think of that word, increase Fukushima shipments of rice Fukushima shipments of rice to Britain. Why are you shipping it everywhere? Why are you growing it there? How'd you get that twisted? How did that become some idea? How are you so evil? Why are you so fucking dark? Why are you so demented? Why are you so sinister? Why are you so hideous? Why are you so monstrous? Why are you so demonic and evil and twisted and demented? And this disgusting. See those turps? Meant to blend in with the grass, right? From the satellite images, I'm sure. 
So other countries that are trying to work out, you got to, like, you're going to drive past that to the Olympics? The people are crazy. From the vault, visiting tsunami hit Japan one year later. There have been some eventful experiences in my career, said Jane F. Ragavan. Literally the stupidest bitch I've ridden in a week. I was in the town of Minima Sakaruku, about 180 kilometers from Fukushima meltdown. 22 days. The trip was sponsored, sponsored by humanitarian aid organization World Vision. Sponsored. You went there because you were given a free trip. And then you got to play it up and say, oh, I don't understand what the big whoop is. Ignore the 30 million one-ton bags throughout the country. Back on shore, some ladies from the Seaweed Processing Center had prepared a simple wakame soup and salad for us. A welcome meal in that freezing February day. That's her final words. In the most radiated place on the planet, eating seaweed in the worst possible place on the planet. <sighs> Well, I don't know if we'll get out on a schedule on Saturday or Sunday, but we'll get out. We're way beyond schedule. We're way behind schedule. Radioactivity and deadly for thousands of years. Radioactive and deadly for thousands of years. Sarcophagus they claimed in 2011 was going to build out a reactor because it was a no-go zone forever. And it is. Like Harvard University is not going there. Reactor is too hot to cover in cement. Typical emits, there's no end in sight. So they're just going to grow food in the most radiated place on the planet because that somehow is a good idea. Somehow that makes sense. Somehow that's going to solve something. Somehow that's going to change the death of the Pacific Ocean. Somehow that's going to make Japan better by murdering everybody. Somehow future, in the near future, next couple of years, people are not going to hate Japan for doing that. <laughs> by the way, Russia just opened the doors for food too. They didn't have to be asked. They're like, no, no, I can ship it to Russia. Critics said are continuing harm is being caused by the plant. Continuing harm. Critics. 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 So you're a critic now if you say that that exists. Ah, uh, conspiracy theorists. Hang on. Forecast map of radioactive clouds show threat to U.S. West Coast. Nuclear forecast. Think about that word. Northern California, radioactive particles concentrating over California. Austrian forecast map shows possible radioactivity east of Los Angeles. West Coast forecast. Near surface clouds from Texas, western U.S. Cesium forecast. Cesium is just a tracer. Surface forecast, Xenon 137 lingering over Florida. Lingering over Florida. Look at a linger. Fukushima forecast radioactive particles concentrate over Midwest U.S. in April 1st and 2nd. April 16th forecast shows radioactive clouds stretching from Texas to Canada and all the way across the Pacific continuously. It's predicted, in fact, the radioactive particles may concentrate as much on the West Coast as anywhere in Fukushima as it keeps coming in wave after wave to the jet streams, which Christopher Busby, by the way, says doesn't exist. It's predicted that, in fact, now the die-offs on the California beaches, seabirds, sea lions, dolphins, how many have to die before somebody cures? How many have to die before somebody cures? But that's what we do, isn't it? We cure? We cure, we cure. And 
Hi, Kira. Hi, everybody. Hi, Matt. Noi. Liz. Anybody I don't get, I'm looking for it, that's all. Mary. Agreed. George. Thank you, Joe. And Joe's 239 joint folks. Anybody wondering us, Joe Moore? Yeah, Ray Delane, where are all the parents protecting the kids? Poor Elaine's going to be bored out of her mind from here on out. Hi, Richard. Cheryl Ann. Hi, everybody. Have we got any questions before we call it a night? A day, a, a year, I guess this is the last stream for the next seven months. <laughs> this is a good day, trust me, I'm just burnt out. I haven't stopped. Like I don't I don't have a second to myself. I don't have a second. Now I'm going out on the ocean for about seven months to record an extinction event. I hope everything is good, but as we know, it's not. Anybody got any questions? Poke them in there. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everybody. Thank you again, Mary. I'm sure. Look, I was meant to do this. I can't deny it. I don't think it matters, James. Hi, Goldwing. Hope you're doing well. Jace. How much fuel vaporized? It could be up to past 20 million pounds. There's 5 million pounds per building. Common stand spent fuel pool was on the ground. Stupidest place imaginable. It got washed away. It had 10 million pounds in it. Everything caught fire and blew up. Looks like a 15 million to 35 million pounds. This is catastrophic. Uh, and questions in capital letters way above. You really don't think I'm going to find that, do you? I, like, the chance of me finding that is next to nothing. I'm looking way above. And I can't go way, way above. I see Elaine's been busy. Sorry, Elaine. Hi, Watchman. Thank you, Elaine, again. Yeah, thanks, James. Now I hear you. I don't know. I can't find it. I can't find it, Lenny. I can't just shoot through all of that. Um... There'll be no protection. I'm totally vulnerable. I'm by myself. There's no one, no one to help. There's no one on the boat to help, I should say. Thank you, Elaine. And thank you for everything you've done up to this stage, Elaine, my goodness. can't emphasize enough uh, how much I appreciated everything you've done and the sacrifices. It's just, it's unbelievable. It makes me cry sometimes. Just, just humbling how everybody has stood by me through the thick and thin and crazy. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I snap. 
uh, under a lot of stress at this stage, obviously. We got to take the boat now, the whole fleet, and drag it all the way up to the end of Canada, to the top right by Alaska. And there's 26,000 islands, and there's everything in the sun can go wrong. And then no big shops between here and there. Once I leave here, I got that one kick just before, like within 30 miles, if I'm going to buy anything extra, I got to pull in in Camel River because I'm an isolated place. There are some things I can't get here, like, like um, pulleys and, and uh, I can't even think now. And some more ropes and a few other odds and ends. Not a lot. I start working my way up the coastline. It's going to be about six weeks of sailing up the coastline. In, and so I'm only going to move the boat. Now, we want to raise enough money because I'm going to be sitting into quite a lot of ports uh, for the first month because I can't get stuck out there in storms, right? You know what I mean? Because we still got storms for the next month or so. And I want to be in a port, find an in internet connection, and be able to update everybody and get the momentum as we head in the summer. Because it's just turned spring, right? Um, eight days ago or something. And so I, I got to be really careful for the next four, five, six weeks. But I'm, I'm hoping that. You know, I'm just waiting for calm winds and then I can move because the boat can't move very far in one day. You're not going to move very, they're like at perfect conditions. I'm traveling at my top speed of seven knots, which is 11 kilometers an hour or something. And so even in a 10 hour day in perfect conditions, that's still only 100 kilometers a day. I'm not going to get that every day but I'm only going to travel in that. And so every time I go into a community, because I got a 25-foot boat and a 32-foot boat, that's, that's over 50 feet. You're, you're, looking at, you're looking at 40, 50 bucks a day to tie up to a wharf with power, which is a safe place to be, which is a smart thing for me to do, but that costs money, right? But once I get up to the top of the coast, or even once I get up a little ways into the dangerous area, there's no more communities, just they're far apart. And so I'm counting on, there's a bunch of small communities in the way, the first couple of hundred miles will give me time to get up to speed and get the kinks out of the system, go into communities and get a break for a day or two of weather, tie up safely, and get the rest of the kinks, get the rest of the things that break or needs to be fixed for the first two or three weeks. I'm going to find all kinds of stuff that are going to get broken or needs that I didn't notice needs to be repaired or fixed or redone. And so I thought this out a lot uh, last year, but now we're doing it. And so I think I got everything, you know, I was... For, for the amount of money we had, because we'd done everything in increments, we saved up our money each time and got the equipment. We, we'd done this the, literally the hardest way it could ever be done. With just single-minded gold that I get to this stage and I could sail up north. Right? Of course, I, I understood that this was not going to be easy. Even if I had everything I wanted, even if I had all the money that I could ever use for the expeditions. I'm still going to run into problems. I'm still going to have nightmares. I'm still going to be under siege. The, the, the nuclear industry is still going to try to attack me constantly and smear me. Now that I'm going to be gone on the ocean, not able to defend myself, uh, they'll attack much more relentlessly to try to discredit me. And this is the most horrifying part of it. It's because I'm not a bad person. I don't hide away from anybody. I'm doing the moral and ethical thing that needed to be done and, and has to be done. And I'm completely open and honest and sincere and genuine. I'm not some random person who 
We covered thousands of headlines before we originally went on the ocean. We don't go in anything blindfolded. We, we take our time, we're methodical, we think things out. You know, as I've been called many times in my life, a tactician. I was trained to be a tactician by my dad on the ocean, to think things way ahead, to be seven steps ahead of the weather and conditions and accidents, and to always be concerned that I'm complacent or that, particularly on good days when everything is looking good, that's when everything usually goes wrong. That's when things get broken. You don't ignore it till it's too late. You ignore it till it's too late because it's a good, beautiful day, blah, blah, blah. So for seven months now, I'm not allowed to drop my guard. For the next seven months, I'm not allowed to sleep normal or live normal or to be normal. For the next seven months, I'm not allowed to make a mistake. The next seven months, I head up to the sea in just a couple of days when the weather breaks. The weather right now looks good. Can I accomplish everything? Because we were set back several days with all the problems in the last couple of days. And, you know, I'd done everything I could to raise the money, and I couldn't raise the money. And so I had to make incredible compromises. Let's hope that doesn't compromise the work. Let's hope that doesn't jeopardize the work, you know? And so all I can say is I hope that I can be successful and get back with the documentation. Once I get back, it's going to take several months for me to upload it all, but we'll be blogging immediately when I get back. Live shows immediately when I get back. Full-on war immediately when I get back. And wreck this industry so that everybody else can say we done our job. So the future generation can look back with pride and say we built off their work. They stood tall, we can too. They, they took the worst and then the rest is easy. Because we're, we're the original killer of the nuclear industry. We, we brought it to them. Like it's our work right here, period. The people that support me, myself, and the people that are active in this fight today, in the last couple of years and in the near future, we're the ones who made the future possible. We're the ones who made the stand. We're the ones who were smart enough to know a lie when it was a lie and call them for her. We were brave enough and had that fortitude and had that vision and were able to have that perseverance and see it through. And we'll get that recognition. Not that I give a frig about recognition, but the recognition that nuclear is inherently evil and the people that are involved on it are mass criminals and murderers and just cowards. The whole industry is just such a coward industry. Everybody involved in it are such cowards. And we call them all out on my website, uh, Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. We flushed out all these cowards. Video after video, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. We've took every major institution, every major nuclear scientist and ripped their lies, found their lies and showed them to be completely not flawed, but malicious intent, and deceptive and disgusting and despicable and subhuman species. The pe people in the nuclear industry are not people. They don't covet life like me or you. They don't even cover themselves. They are just hateful, disgusting, pathetic subhumans. That's what a journalist is. That's what an academic is. I'll see everybody in seven months, yeah? And seven months will call quick with your support. We could be back a lot quicker. I say seven months because that's the extreme of roughing it. I don't suspect I'll have to rough it the whole time. I'm not really roughing it now, per se. We have an incredible different operation than the last time. And much more complex, way better equipment. I'm unbelievably, unimaginably grateful and humiliated and humbled that so many people have done everything possible to get me to this stage. And the truth be known, I couldn't be prouder. I couldn't be, I couldn't be more prouder 
uh, to lead the church in the way that I do, the capacity that I have, and with the bills, the ability that I had before Fukushima, I always gotta, you know, scold myself for not being more active pre-Fukushima, because we could have avoided Fukushima if I had to come out louder and spoke stronger and with more force and with more authority before Fukushima. It's something I'll regret that I didn't come out. And so this is maybe why I'm so vocal now. This is why I'm so relentless now. This is, I have to atone for not speaking out sooner. And I think we'll all feel that weight, that burden, and that humility in the near future. Except for this group right here that stood strong through the thick and the thin and seen it through. You're the heroes. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. You're the heroes. I exist because you asked for me. You begged for the boogeyman. That's what you got. I don't like being called the boogeyman, but in this circumstance, I'll take it as pride because the nuclear industry needs a boogeyman to sort them out. We done it. The documentation is up at the nuclear proctologist. Get over there and enjoy it when you get a chance. I'll be updating at the nuclear procto or the beautiful girl by Dana on YouTube rather. As we pull in the ports, we'll update you every chance we get when we can find the connection and we can afford it, we'll do it. Hugs for everybody. God bless everyone. <laughs>